Praise God. We're glad you're all here tonight. The Lord is good. Praise God. Let's have a word of prayer before we uh, begin. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, you are so good to us. We look to you for all things, Lord, because, Lord, sometimes we don't know or we don't have the answers, but, but you do, Lord. You never fail us. You never leave us. We can always count on you, Lord. So tonight, we look to you, that you just minister each and every one that's here, and that you have your way, Lord. For those at home, Lord, you bless them. And we just thank you, Lord, again, for your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name, praise God. Tonight we're going to be uh, covering um, the first 13 verses of Luke chapter 4. We'll continue on with the book of Luke. And uh, last time, the ministry of uh, John the Baptist was covered. And uh, we know that John the Baptist was... Um, he came before Christ. He came to open the way for Jesus. And John the Baptist was quite a minister. He ministered boldly. And we know that uh, he suffered because of that and um, lost his life eventually. But John the Baptist was preaching to all the people that we look in uh, Luke chapter 3. It says in verse 7 that he, uh, he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers or generation of vipers who warn you to flee from the wrath to come. He didn't hold back. He just ministered to them. And uh, in any case, he was ministering to the people. And uh, they were asking, what shall we do? In verse 11, he answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give one. Let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. He was ministering to them how they should have a heart of giving, how they should serve others, how they should minister to people around them who maybe didn't have, who had needs. And then, uh, like I said, the different people came to him. Tax collectors came to him in verse 12. It says, then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? He didn't tell them to quit their job. He told them, verse 13, collect no more than what is appointed for you. Don't collect any more than that. Because some of the tax collectors used to do that, collect more than they were supposed to be collecting. So he just told them, collect what you need to collect. And it says in verse 14 that even soldiers asked him, saying, and what shall we do? So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone. Don't try and use your power as a guard, as a soldier, to try to intimidate or bully anyone. And he says, or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Don't try to um, get money from people to set things aside. So he was telling them the way that it, things should be. And like I said, he was ministering to them all. And uh, he indicated that he indeed baptized with water. But then he said in verse 16, but one is mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He was talking about Jesus. And then we see the bapti baptism of Jesus in verse 21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Praise God. So, we see the example of Christ being baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. 
And uh, there was a purpose for him being baptized. It was a picture of his own baptism, the crucifix, crucifix, crucifixion on the cross. As Pastor Mike would say, it's easy for you to say. <laughs> but he was setting the example for you and I. And John the Baptist baptized him. And um, we see how the Spirit of God fell upon him in verse 22. The Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So we begin with the temptation of Christ in Luke chapter 4. There's only 13 verses we'll be covering, so we won't be going that long, but they're very important verses to know and to study. It says in uh, verse 1, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So we read in verse 3 how Jesus was filled with the Spirit. And it was the Spirit of God that led him into the wilderness. There was a purpose and a reason for him going there. It wasn't just, just to go into the wilderness. It says that he was led by the Spirit. When we go somewhere, when we do things, are we being led by the Spirit? You know, as Christians, as believers, we want to do as much as we can according to the will of God. And it's not always it seems like it's not always possible. It's not always easy. You know, we fail, but we need to be cognizant and aware of the Spirit of God when we say things, when we do things, when we go somewhere, to be led by the Spirit of God. If we're led by the Spirit of God, we can't go wrong. We can't. We may be attacked in some ways. Things may happen in our lives, but we can't go wrong when we're led by the Spirit of God. So we're aware of the Spirit of God. And we, we know that God has a purpose for you and I. And each one of us needs to listen to the voice of God. Have you heard the voice of God speak to you? I'm sure we all have in some way or another. That God has told us to do something. To go to someone. To minister to somebody. To do something for the Lord. For his glory. And when we feel that, we feel a peace. We may wonder, is this of the Lord? Is God really leading me in this way? Is God telling me to do this or go, or go over there? If we have that peace of God, this is where trusting in God comes in, to go boldly by hearing the voice of God. You know, And we're going to know if it's not God right away. Oops, I shouldn't have said this. Or, But you know, most of the time, I believe that if we feel in our hearts that God is speaking to us, we're going to do the right thing. Because God wants us to do the right thing. You know, when Jesus was baptized, like I said, he set that example for you and I. And as we read the scriptures, we see example after example of Jesus doing something for our benefit. How many remember when they were baptized in water? It was a beautiful, beautiful experience. You know, my wife and I were baptized many years ago. But uh, it's something you don't forget. And, uh, and the Spirit of God did fall upon us in that swimming pool that we were in. We really felt the Spirit of God fall upon us. And it was such a beautiful feeling that uh, uh, it's hard to describe unless you go through it. And so we encourage people that are not baptized in water to be baptized. We're baptized because we're saved. We're not saved. We're not baptized to be saved because Jesus paid the price on the cross for our salvation. He did all the work. We're saved because of him, not because we were baptized. But it's good to be baptized. Amen? It's, you know, scripture, we read scripture after scripture to be baptized in water. And even Jesus set that example of being baptized. Praise God. So if we listen to the voice of God, we're not going to listen to um, the other voice, the enemy. The Word of God tells us to be spiritually minded and not carnally minded. And that's what Romans uh, chapter 8 tells us. 
If we turn to Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, nor to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, again, who are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Thank you, Lord. And that gives us a spiritually peace in our hearts and in our minds. If we read uh, verse 6 of that same chapter of Romans 8, it says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The peace of God. Thank you, Lord. And that's what we want. We want the peace of God in our lives. Even when we're going through troubles and situations that are difficult for us, we have the peace of God in our lives. If we turn back to um, Luke chapter 4. It says in verse 2, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. Well, let's read one and two. They go together. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. So we see that Jesus was tempted during the 40 days that he was in the wilderness. That's what the Word of God says, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And then he was fasting. He wasn't eating during those days. The devil looks for vulnerable times or errors in our lives to deceive to try to tempt us, and he knew that Jesus was hungry. And um, we know that the devil is a, a liar, he's a thief, a deceiver, and many, many other things he is that are not good. John 10.10 10 tells us, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus has come to give us life. Thank you, Lord. So that's what the devil is looking at. And he'll look for, for um, weak areas in our own lives to try to attack us, to deceive us. That's why we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And like we read, to have that peace and that life in God so that we're not deceived, because that's the devil's business. To deceive. That's what he does. We read about the uh, temptations of Christ, and we know that they take place in two different locations. I don't know whether, whether you thought of that or not. First of all, in verse 1, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and being tempted for 40 days by the devil. He was tempted in the wilderness by the devil. And if we look in verse 9, it says, then he brought him, he brought Jesus to Jerusalem to set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. So he took him to Jerusalem and also tempted him there in the wilderness and in Jerusalem. Praise God. The wilderness was where um, God met the people after he had brought them out of Egypt. He met the people there, and he ministered to them, and he led the people by a cloud and fire, a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. 
In Exodus 13, 21. Exodus 13, 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. The Lord always leading his people. He leads you and I by the same light, <coughs> by the same covering. And he covers us when there's things going on in our lives and we feel like there's a, when we feel the heat, there's a cool cloud over us. And when we feel like we're in darkness, we feel the light of the fire, the pillar of fire of the Lord to guide us. And that's what his word is. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Lord leading us through his word. The Lord always being there ministering with the words that we need at that particular time. The Lord is always there. Amen. Amen. And we want him to lead us in the right way. You know, we spent, everybody has spent different amount of years leading our own way, depending on when we came to the Lord. And once we came to the Lord, we saw something new, we felt something new, we felt the leading of God like we had never felt before. And that's what God wants to continue doing every day in our lives to lead us and to guide us and to just uh, show us what he wants of us. You know, the two locations are kind of a, a contrast from each other. We, we said that the wilderness was where um, God had met the people at Sinai after he had brought them out of Egypt, and he led them through the wilderness all those 40 years, providing for them, being there for them, never disappointing them. They certainly disappointed him many, many times through disobedience and questioning the reason they were out there and uh, questioning uh, Moses and just being rebellious. But yet God loved the people. He never drew away from them. He was always guiding them. That's the wilderness. The other location, Jerusalem, on the other hand, at that time of Jesus, it was the center of Jewish power and, uh, and worship by the religious leaders. At the time of Jesus, the second temple had been renovated and had been expanded by Herod, King Herod. You know, it was actually uh, Herod the Great. You know, there were six different Herods, you know, and that the Bible speaks of. But this is Herod the Great. And uh, he had uh, expanded the uh, temple. So this was the time of Jesus. In the temptation of Christ, the devil tries to question the Christ's identity as the Son of God. He tries to question of who he is. The devil knows who he is. Believe me, he fears Jesus. He fears the Lord. But he tries to deceive in um, verse 3. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. If, as if he didn't know, he is the Son of God. And in verse 9, Then he brought him up to Jerusalem to set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him again, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down from here. And then he goes on with the temptation. We know Jesus is the Son of God. When he came into our lives as a personal Savior, we came to know Jesus in a personal way, like we had never known him before. We may have gone to church growing up. We may have been uh, religious, but we really didn't know Jesus. We know who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. He's the one who came to give his life for you and I. He who was without sin took our sins upon him. He became sin for you and I, the one who was without sin. That's who Jesus is, our Savior, our Redeemer, our High Priest. Thank you, Lord. In um, Luke chapter 3, 
You may have gone over the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and maybe not. There's a lot of uh, begot and begots. But it says, in, um, as it goes on, now in verse 23 of chapter 3 of Luke, now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli. And then it goes on, of the genealogy. But in verse 38, we read, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Jesus is the son of God. Thank you, Lord. There was one um, devout man who loved the Lord. And in chapter 2 of Luke, it tells us that the Lord had spoken to him that he was not going to see death before he would see the Savior. If we turn to uh, I think Luke chapter 2. Beginning with verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. He was filled with the Spirit of God. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Wow, isn't that something? He knew that he was going to die eventually. But before that, he was going to be blessed to see the Lord's Christ. In verse 27, so he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. I can die in peace now. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people to Israel. This was the Savior who's going to bring salvation not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. Salvation to all who would believe in him. It says in verse 32, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, that's you and I. And then the glory of your people to Israel. He brought salvation for those who were ready to receive him. In um, the chapter of uh, Luke, verses 1 through 13, the devil's last temptations of Christ are in three areas. Now we read that during the 40 days that he was in the desert, he was tempted by the devil. And then we're reading of the three temptations that he brought to Jesus. First, he tempted Jesus to look to himself to meet his own needs. Self-indulgence in uh, Luke 4, 3. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. He was trying to tempt Jesus to look to himself, to meet his own needs. How many times have we accomplished something, whether it's a job or, or you know, a competition or whatever, and we may say, look what I've accomplished. Look what I've done. You know, lifting ourselves up instead of thanking God for his blessings because all blessings come from God the things that he gives us the apostle Paul knew where all his blessings and his needs came from 
continually. And he thanked God. He knew it wasn't from himself. Paul never tried to glorify himself or to lift himself up. But he was always lifting up the Lord. If we turn to Philippians chapter 4. Beginning with verse um, 18, Philippians 4, 18. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice while pleasing to God. He was just blessing he was blessed and thanking for the things that he had. It says in verse 19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. His God, our God, shall supply all our needs. Even when things seem uh, remote, like they're not going to happen. And we have a need. God is going to meet that needs. You know, there are many testimonies of people having a need and God just blessing them, bringing that need at the right time, maybe the right amount. Whatever it is, God meets that needs. He will supply all our needs. And then we read where the devil tempted Jesus to try to change his loyalty away from God. He flatters him with riches and glory. We'll read uh, Luke 4, beginning with verse 5. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. This world is the devil's. And he wants to tempt people with things of this world. We have things. We have finances because we need those things. But if we look to those things and glorify those things, then we're away from the things of God. It says in verse 7, Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Can you imagine? Trying to tempt Jesus, worship me, and all of this will be yours. Jesus, who was in heaven, we can't even picture the beauty, the magnificence of heaven. And the devil tries to tempt him with these things. And Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. You know, some of these uh, quick, rich schemes that sometimes uh, we hear or we see or a telephone call, they try to take our eyes off of Jesus. We start to worship money and things rather than God. And that's what the devil is trying to do. Look, look, I can give you all of this if you just worship me. If we start worshiping money, we start worshiping uh, physical, material things. Like I said before, we have need for finances. You know, we need to work, we need to have shelter, food, all these things, and those things are good. But if things take our eyes off the Lord, and something is not right. In First Timothy chapter six.
beginning with verse 6. We'll read uh, 6 through 10. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Money is not the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is what it says here. So we put the Lord before anything that's happening in our lives. And then the third thing the devil tempted Jesus was to question whether God was with him or not. If we go back to Luke chapter 4. We read in Luke 4, 9. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. You know, we're not called to test God in any areas. You know, God, when he makes a promise, he's going to keep that promise. We don't have to test God. If God has spoken, he said, this is going to happen. God will answer our prayers. You know, the Israelites While they were in the wilderness, they were complaining about food, about water, about the ability of God to provide for them. He had brought them out of Egypt, out of slavery. He had brought them. He had opened the the Red Sea for them to cross over. And yet, they were doubting the ability of God to provide for them. Isn't that something? Have we forgotten any of the things that God has done for us? You know, we pray that God, that you will answer this prayer, and God answers it. And down the road, we forget what God has done for us because we get involved in so many things. In Psalm 78, We'll read um, from 9 to 11. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and wonders that he had shown them. And then verse 17. 17 through 22. But they sinned even more against him, but rebelled against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? questioning the ability of God to provide. Therefore the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, Jacob, and anger also came upon up against Israel, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. And as you read on, he provided meat for them, quail, that gave them so much that was coming out 
their nostrils, the word of God tells us. He met their needs and more. But they were doubting God. They were doubting of what he had done for them. They were doubting of his ability to provide. God is a Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We may need some little things, but he will provide those things. You know, in this, in this account, in chapter 4, we see that both Jesus and the devil quote scripture. And Jesus from Deuteronomy and the devil from uh, Psalm 91. But we need to know more about the word <coughs> and more than just quoting the word. You know, we can say the scriptures, but do we really have the scriptures in our heart, in our lives? Do we live by the scriptures? We must read the scriptures, understand them, and apply them to our hearts, in our lives. Because the word of God is living and powerful. So we need the word of God in our lives. Our lives need to be rooted in the word of God. To obey it and be faithful to God. When we have the word of God in our lives, we're not just quoting words that we've memorized, but it's a living epistle. It's a living word in our hearts and in our lives that we can share with others. That's what brings others to Christ. Not our words, but the word of God. This was going to bring people to God, to God, salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. In verse um, 4 of chapter 4 of Luke, we read that. It said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And we read that in Deuteronomy 8, 3. The Word of God tells us, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger. He was speaking to the people, the Israelites, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And then in, uh, back to uh, Luke 4. Jesus answered and said to him, verse 8, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall worship. Back to Deuteronomy 6. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, and shall take oaths in his name. You shall serve the, only the Lord thy God. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who, who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. That's when they were um, complaining about water. And uh, the Lord provided for them from the rock in, uh, in the Old Testament. And uh, the people there were complaining, again, about the provisions of God. But he provided for them as he always does. And then in verse 12 of, uh, back to... Uh, To Luke, you thought I forgot which book, huh? <laughs> okay. In 4.12, Jesus answered and said to him, 
it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You don't have to turn there, but I'll go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Six and seven. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. It says in verse 16 You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa again. You know, the Lord knows of things that occur in our own lives. You know, we're tempted at different times of our lives in different ways. And uh, God knows what's going on in our lives and these temptations that come. He's compassionate. Jesus was tempted, yet he didn't fall. He went through sufferings. And like I said before, he took our own sins. But he's a compassionate high priest because he knows our lives. In Hebrews chapter 4, beginning with verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's the Jesus that we serve. He knows what we go through. But he was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Thank you, Lord. You know, we know that temptation comes without warnings. And uh, sometimes people submit to those temptations. Maybe an opportunity comes. You know, someone may see some money or something that's not theirs and they take it. The temptation was there. Lying, cheating, gossiping, any of these things that may come where we can hold back and not fall into those temptations, those traps. But like I said, if our eyes are upon Jesus, we're going to feel that in our, heart, in our hearts not to do those things. But we need to be in communion with God. It says that Jesus was praying in the wilderness. He was communion communicating with God, his Father. We are to pray in that communion with God. We need to daily prepare our hearts and our lives to whatever is going to come in that particular day because we don't know. You know. Every day is a new day. Anything can happen in a new day. Praying and reading our word is something that fights against temptation. Because how we respond to those temptations is going to affect our lives one way or the other. How we respond. And the devil will try again and again. Like it says in uh, Luke 4.13. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Another time. And that's what he will do with you and I. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, we know how fervently he was praying because he knew what was coming. And he told the apostles to wait. Wait, I'll be back. And when he came back, he found them sleeping. And he told them, verse 41, Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. Praise God. So like I said, the Lord knows what's going on in our lives. 
And the word says that he will always provide a way of escape in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Beginning with verse 9. Now let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with a temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Isn't God wonderful? He's there with us to protect us to see us through everything that comes our way. Like I said, at times we fail, but God is merciful. He sees our lives, he knows what we have need of, and he set the example in, in, uh, in getting baptized and going through the temptations that came his way, yet he didn't fall. And he encourages you and I to also follow his way, to look to him, because if we look to ourselves, you know, we're gonna fail. If we try to lift ourselves up, Take heed lest we fall, what the Word of God says. Praise God. Pastor Mike. Praise God. The Lord is good, amen. Um, Brother Daniel really blessed us uh, tonight. Uh, I'm very thankful and appreciative of uh, you you wouldn't have known that he got a phone call from me yesterday evening asking for this help to be here tonight and being ready in season and out of season is not an easy thing to do and he shared flawlessly as if he'd been preparing for a week and that's how good God is he makes us ready in, in, in times of need and even as we went through this look at the, the temptation that Christ went through how how the enemy came against him in areas where he was weak. Brother shared in this last scripture how even when we go through times, even when we feel like it might be overwhelming, like that temptation just might be too tough for us to handle, he always gives us an opportunity. He always gives us a way out. The, the plan, the blueprint of the enemy is nothing that is new. He sticks to his same pattern. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These are things he comes against us with. He, att he, he attacks in areas where we're weak. He knows where we fall short. And we saw the, the perfect Christ lead us an example in exactly what we should do. As Brother Daniel said, be in the word of God. Know the word of God so we can defend ourselves. This is a sword. This is a weapon that we can use, a spiritual weapon against the enemy. This is what we've been given by God to use. What was the circumstance that Jesus was in? As Brother Daniel shared, that the enemy, the Word of God says, is that the world is under the sway of the wicked one. So that Adam was given dominion, and he lost that. And that Jesus came back to Take all these things back, and he will. And he paid the price already at the cross. But so when the enemy offered that to Christ, it was, you don't have to pay anything for this. You can have everything you wanted. Just bow down to me. Does that sound familiar? That's the lie of the enemy to each and every one of us. You don't have to serve God. You don't have to truly do what the Word of God instructs. Just be a good person. Just do what I tell you to do. You, you're, you're hungry. You have this need. You deserve it. That's the battle cry of the world. You. Or me, I should say. Not me, but me. 
And we know that God is greater than these things. And as we saw, even the, the, the final uh, verse that Brother Daniel shared, it says that the enemy's not going to give up. Say, well, we're going through a tough trial, but we're going to get through it. Praise God. But it's not going to be your last. <laughs> because we know until we get home, we need that those new those new bodies those heavenly those heavenly bodies that we wait for because these these old brittle things keep breaking down <laughs> they keep falling apart and we constantly go oh lord help us we need another band-aid to patch this thing up so we can keep going and god is faithful and he continues to carry us through but understand that it says even when jesus spoke the enemy said he's departing until another opportune time how many opportune times do we give the enemy? <laughs> if it says looking for an opportunity against Christ, that's an impossibility. With me, it's a const on a constant basis. We have to be careful. We put ourselves in a position by the way we live to give the enemy so many opportunities. And we have to be mindful of those things. And that's going to carry us through and strengthen us. So praise God. So I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to call the Brother Regis forward. And tonight, if you, if you need prayer, we're going to open the altar. Because as, as we know, fasting is a denying of, of the physical for the spiritual. It is putting this flesh second and placing the things of God first. Saying, you know what, Lord, I need you more than I need substance to keep me alive. That's what fasting is. It doesn't sound like that when you're hungry. <laughs> but that's what we're doing. We're standing strong in the things of God. And as we see these examples, we want to definitely continue to step out in those, to be in the Word of God, to get strengthened, to be ready. Because when is the best time to be prepared for the battle? Before it begins. Not midstream. Not when we're under attack. Not when we're getting just, and some of us may be going through those things right now. But we can still cry out to God. But the time of preparation is before they come. So that we can stand strong and be deep rooted in the word of God. So let's bow our heads and open the altar. And if there's anyone that needs prayer tonight, you can come. The leaders will pray with you. We stand with you. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for this word, Lord. For it is true, Lord. We thank you the beautiful example that you give us Lord Father the, the strength Father that you even give each and every one of us as we, we see you go before us in all things and that, Father we know your word says you will never leave us nor forsake us and we can trust in you and Father we ask this night that you be with us you help us, you strengthen us Lord and that your mighty will be done Father you bless anyone here who needs a touch from you Father Father, if there's anyone that needs that touch, you bring them to this altar. Father, that by your Holy Spirit, you would continue to move in their life. Father, bless and keep your people in a mighty way. Bless those who are at home, Lord, in the same likeness. Those who are suffering, those who need a touch from you. Father, bring peace, bring strength, bring healing. We know you are a God who is able. We just open the altar, even this night, knowing you are a God who is able to do all things. And we put these things in your hands. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The altar is open. If there's anyone that desires prayer tonight, you come. Uh, the leaders will pray with you. Praise God. If not, you can. We can just worship God where we stand.